The so-called lunatics of the past did not have an easy time of it. Those raving madmen and women were often treated more like monsters or deranged zombies than people with a mental illness. Sometimes said to be agitated by the moon, perhaps cursed by the devil, the mentally ill of the past might be shackled, fastened to a wall, beaten, or might undergo extreme and mostly inefficient forms of treatment. Picture this scene, something that sometimes happened to schizophrenics or epileptics before those words existed. They're tied to a chair that's suspended from a ceiling by ropes. The chair is spun violently around and around, not for minutes, but sometimes for hours, until the occupant throws up the contents of his stomach. But it got even worse, and in those old asylums, many patients didn't make it out. If we're going to talk about the horror of the early asylums, then there's only one place to start, and that's with the institution once known as Bedlam. This notorious asylum was said to be the first of its kind in Europe and London was its home. Before such asylums were opened for people deemed lunatics, from the word luna, and so maddened by the moon, there was of course mental illness. In ancient times, this was sometimes said to be an affliction sent from the gods, but there were less superstitious people who believed that the ailment was purely physical. Nonetheless, in ancient times, people still had visions. They hallucinated, were depressed, and skulls dug up from thousands of years ago show that before death, the skull had been trephined or trepened. That means making a hole in the skull. In those days, it was believed whatever bad spirit was making the person crazy might find its way out through the hole. Even today, you can find cultures in which the mentally ill are said to be cursed. But first, let's talk about the asylum whose name everyone knows. These days, when we hear the word bedlam, it's mostly when someone is using it as an adjective to describe chaos or pandemonium. How was the protest? What happened after the explosion? How was teaching a class of 50 kids after they'd all had sugary drinks for lunch? The answer to all could be Bedlam. The institution became synonymous with chaos, and we'll soon see why. Bedlam was a nickname for the place, and it first went by the name Priory of the New Order of Our Lady of Bethlehem. We won't talk too much about those early days, but in the 13th and 14th centuries, it was merely a hospital for the poor. It was said to be in the 15th century that it transitioned more to an insane asylum and also to a place to lock up people deemed insanely dangerous. Around this time, we can find some reports of what life was like in Bedlam, with some sources saying patients would live in dank cells, sometimes covering themselves with their own filth. In the 1600s, one person said what he saw were cryings, screechings, roarings, brawlings, shaking of chains, swearings, frettings, chafings. As time went on, physicians became more interested in trying to cure lunacy than to merely lock people away in abject filth and forget about them. Some of the earliest treatments were quite mild, with cold baths or hydrotherapy being very popular in the 1700s. But that was about as good as it got, because like those ancients thinking people could be purged of mental illness, the English doctors believed madness could be drawn out. To do this, sometimes they would bleed the patients, which was simply drawing blood, but sometimes using leeches for the job. As we said, they might be spun around and induced to puke, but they might also just be given a purgative drink to make them violently ill and emit profusely from both the mouth and the rear end. If that didn't work, doctors might go to work on the skin, scarring the person or rubbing them with ointments that would make the skin blister. You can imagine that was the last thing someone needed who was depressed or paranoid. You might also be surprised that at Bedlam, you would find cupping glass therapy, the suction treatment that's quite popular today and leaves you looking like you've been massaged by a fat horse. What surely made this worse, though, was the fact that many of the patients were fastened to manacles, and so treatment wasn't exactly pleasant, nor did the service come with a smile. It was likely closer to torture than curative therapy. Just to give you an idea of how mental illness was thought of, in the 17th century, two statues were made at Bedlam. One depicted melancholy and the other raving madness. The former just lies listless, while the latter is chained and looks rather perturbed. In today's world, we might say these statues represent depression and perhaps a more psychotic kind of illness. But you might find yourself in bedlam if you were merely a habitual thief, and one very famous patient was the fortune teller Daniel Baker who it said predicted the Great Fire of London. Even in the 18th century, Bedlam wasn't exactly a holiday home, with patients still being beaten and starved until the thing inside them had vacated. 
In 1811, one physician wrote, In Bedlam, the straight waistcoat when necessary, and occasional purgatives are the principal remedies. Nature, time, regimen, confinement, and seclusion from relations are the principal auxiliaries. As you can imagine, many patients became sick and died, and so burial grounds were built around the place. The bodies were useful, too, because dissection was becoming popular, so physicians could learn more about anatomy. Often, what went on in Bedlam stayed in Bedlam. But in the 19th century, investigations happened. What some people saw when they entered were people chained naked to walls, left screaming, moaning, starving. Because the theory of the day was, if you could break a person's will, you could drive out the madness. Even worse, Bedlam was sometimes treated like a human zoo, so anyone with a few shillings to spare could pay entrance and walk around looking at the lunatics chained up and listen to their ravings. In 1711, in a book called Man of Feeling, the author described his visit to the zoo. He said, Their conductor led them first to the dismal mansions of those who were in the most horrid state of incurable madness, the clanking of chains, the wildness of their cries, and the imprecations which some of them uttered formed a scene of inexpressibly shocking. Another person described it as a freak show. Things significantly improved in the early 20th century. But hey, it wouldn't be long until lobotomy with an ice pick would come along. The USA had its own asylums too, with the Blackwell Island Insane Asylum said to be a place where inhumane things happened. A female journalist in 1887 did something quite heroic. She pretended to be mad and got herself admitted so she could see what went down in the asylum. On the inside, she acted how she would normally act, sane, but that didn't matter in terms of how she was treated. She wrote this of a day in her loony life there when she interviewed a fellow female patient. The patient said, For crying, the nurses beat me with a broom handle and jumped on me. Then they tied my hands and feet, and throwing a sheet over my head, twisted it tightly around my throat so I could not scream, and thus put me in a bathtub filled with cold water. They held me under until I gave up every hope and became senseless. They broke her will, but it didn't cure her of anything. In New York, it wasn't so different from the UK back then, with treatments mainly based on purging the illness. These were called humoral treatments, and as we said, might involve bloodletting, blistering, and expelling whatever is in the stomach. But it's said in the early 20th century, a doctor at New Jersey's Trenton State Hospital took things a bit further. He removed parts of the body for good. He took out the tonsils of patients or even rotting teeth because he thought the malady might come from those places, sometimes called America's biggest quack. This man called Henry Cotton then started to remove bits of the stomach, the intestines, part of the thyroid gland, the colon, appendix, or gallbladder. Not surprisingly, many patients didn't make it and died while being cured by this mad doctor. At around the same time, another quack was injecting patients with malaria, thinking the fever would make them sane. Many of those patients didn't make it either. About 15% of them died. But we can go to some places around the world today where you might find more superstitious treatments. In 2018, The Atlantic wrote a long piece saying exorcisms were gaining traction these days, noting one story in the US where a family called in an exorcist because their daughter seemed to be fighting the devil inside. Now this isn't exactly about asylums, but it's worth mentioning. Because if these people are actually mentally ill and not putting up the Prince of Darkness in their bodies rent-free, then it's still kind of a purgative treatment. It's not unlike those treatments in the asylums, tie someone up, starve them, leave them, and beat the devil out of them. According to The Atlantic, citing a Gallup poll, about 50% of Americans believe demonic possession is real. Maybe by daring to say possession might be a mental illness, we might have upset a lot of our very pious viewers. But such superstitious beliefs are global. We found an article with an interview with the director of one of Thailand's largest psychiatric facilities. He talked about what he found when his team went to do outreach work in the countryside for the first time. He said, We would go around all the villages in the north trying to locate people who needed our help. We would find someone who had been locked in a cage or a small room in nearly every village. The locals would use traditional methods to cure them, like offering gifts of chickens and wine to the spirit so it might release the victim from a demonic grasp. Hmm, chickens to propitiate the spirits. And the doctor said much of the time they were merely autistic children in the cages. That was not always the case though. During that tour of the facility, the interviewer met a Thai woman who was convinced she was a Scottish princess. Such a patient today will be treated with compassion and respect. 
but if the Thai Scottish royal had been around a century ago, she might have been dressed in a straitjacket and deliberately put into a low blood sugar coma. This was actually a thing in the early 20th century. Doctors might have also induced seizures in her, or maybe nursed her as a baby so she could grow up again. Yeah, that included bottle feeding and carrying a patient around like a newborn. These days, perhaps the treatments that scare people the most have to do with shocking the mind with electricity, but it's rarer now and only used in extreme circumstances. We've already done an entire show on the history of lobotomies, so we won't go into that here. We'll just say that it wasn't long ago that ice pick lobotomies and other forms of the operation were done to people who certainly didn't need one. We'll just ask you one question, and that's what do you think about all this? Tell us in the comments. Also, be sure to check out our other video, Worst Prison Experiments Conducted on Humans. Thanks for watching, and as always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time.